The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. We're in the 10th chapter. We have broken verses 22 through 25. Actually, we got four studies, but we broke them down on uh, the uh, hortatory subjunctives that are used. You can, they're identified in verse 22 as let us, verse 23, let us, 24, 25, let us. That's a key, uh, at least in a New American Standard. I, I haven't really kept up with the King James, but I guess it's true with that too. That is a key uh, to let you know that's a hortatory subjunctive. And we discussed that, uh, and, and so we've been doing, and what it's about, look in verse 21, what the subject is about is great priest over the house of God, and what this is about is priesthood function, our great, our great priest, and here is our function as, uh, as believer priest under the new covenant, here's some of our responsibility, he lays it out, the writer lays them out in uh what we call hortatory subjunctives. And we have looked at verse 22. We've looked at verse 23. We've looked at verse 24, 25. But notice in verse 24 where we are, 24, 25, it is the third hortatory subjunctive, which means that's, that it's identified as a second person plural and uh, or first person plural, whatever. And... Um, and, of course, I explained the subjunctive, why it's a subjunctive. I've already done that. I don't want to go back over that. Uh, but here's ours. Let us consider, this is the third one. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. So that is what we call an adjunctive conjunction, the word chi. And it connects these two things uh, under the concept, let us consider how to stimulate one another, one, to love, and two, to good works or divine production. And then he does something really interesting, which gave us another, uh, another lesson, which is tonight made us four rather than three. He does what he does now. He's going to run a series of three principles active participles and these become markers this is ABC this is one two three business first he says not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some that's the first ones I don't know if your Bible if you have a study Bible my new, my new American standard has the word forsaken underlined but, but, but anyhow, uh, not forsaking, that's one, uh, as is the habit of some, but encouraging, that's number two. And all the more as you see the day drawing near is the third, drawing near. So there are three present active uh, 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 participles uh, used. Now the participle here is going to be like the English uh, in many ways. But you look for them in the Greek because they become markers for you. The, the language sets up markers for you and often. And the writer of Hebrews, this is one of his characteristics of writing. I mean, we have seen this over and over, and we just looked at chapters 8, 9, and 10 under the New Covenant. But it's a, it's a way he writes, and, and it's, it's really good for us that like the language. Uh, so, what we're looking at is, we, we, last night we looked at consider how to stimulate one another to love, that's agape. Tonight we're looking at and to good deeds, the idea of and good deeds. Now, what's interesting here is that there, there is the word, the word for good is, is agathos. And the word for deeds is ergon or it means good works, 
good works. And agathos ergon is a reference to the divine work as decreed or willed by God. <clears throat> like in Romans 8, 28. Right? You're familiar with that. All, you know, God works all things together for good. Okay. Now, there are like three Greek words for good that are, uh, that are dominant, but the two dominant ones are agape and kalos, which is we'll talk about tonight. The two, uh, the good, the good deeds. Let's see. I don't think that word "good deeds" in verse twenty-four. Let me look at that. That verse twenty-four is kalos. I think I said agathos. That's the word kalos. In, in 1024 is the word kalos, not agathos. But they're in, they're in conjunction to one another. And they have a little me different meaning or twist to them. And, and we'll talk about that tonight in our study. But let me make sure we correct the word good in verse 24 is kalos, not agathos. All right, let's hold one word of prayer and we'll get into this thing tonight. How to stimulate one another in uh, kalos ergon in good works. Let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment. It looks like we're all home people. So for those who are visiting with us by the internet, by home people, I mean that they, they are saved, that they believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And they understand the principle of you can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is sin, personal sin. The way to resolve that, because the Holy Spirit is there. He's been quenched and grieved, and you're in carnality. The Holy Spirit is not left. He's not able to leave until, because of John 14, 16, he's there forever. So the principle is, how do we get out of carnality into spirituality of, of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3? The answer is 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sin. Mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue and overt sins should be Confessed in silence and privacy. And that restores you to fellowship with the Holy Spirit who will teach you the word of God tonight. Okay. That's priesthood responsibility. You go ahead and do that. And so our Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. Uh, what a privilege it is, Father, to know that you will never leave us nor forsake us, no matter how we behave, that our unfaithfulness doesn't affect your faithfulness to us and what you have promised us through Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that principle of grace. I pray tonight, Father, that we, as we study this principle of our priesthood, that we would understand the importance of it in our daily living and the function of it in the local church or the body of Christ locally. I pray the Holy Spirit would teach us tonight uh, how to, to consider how to stimulate one another to, di to divine good, divine production. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so what is interesting in verse 25, the word forsaking, not forsaking as a negative, not forsaking, and the word encouraging and the word drawing near, okay, are all present active participles. Now, let me tell you why this is important to our study tonight. Uh, Dante, in his... That's an advanced Greek grammar book, which students that go through here get, get introduced second and third level of years of Greek. He, he gives a great understanding of the participle use by, by the Greek in the Bible. And he says the Greek participle is not a mood. That's important. It's not a mood. It's a verbal uh, substantive. It's not a mood. It's not like an indicative or an imperative. It's not a mood. 
And, and that's, that's very important to, the, to when you find a participle or an infinitive. And that's true in the English as well as the Greek. Therefore, a participle functions in a verse like an adjective. Now, it looks like a verb, and it, can be, and it is a verbal noun concept, but used like an adjective. So sometimes it reflects a noun or a subject, and sometimes it reflects a verb. It always in conjunction with that concept. Now, that's important. He goes on to say something really interesting about the way it's used adjectively. He says the participle is used when the real object of the governing verse is a person or a thing whose act, now this is important, whose act or state is described by the participle. In other words, when the participle acts like an adjective, and that's its primary function, then it's descriptive. It's descriptive. It, and it's giving you more information pertaining to the, to the person or the thing of what's going on between the subject and the verb. Okay? Now, we have three of them in verse 25. We have three. He says, <clears throat> he says and, uh, uh, and not forsaking, remember this falls under Consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking, and this is a priesthood idea, not forsaking our assembling together. Listen, and here's the problem. That's why he's talking about it. As is the habit of some. Right? I mean, how are you going to learn if you don't go to church? How are you going to learn if you, if you don't put yourself in a learning position? Right? So that's the first problem that pe people have. I mean, how, how you, the reason you learn the Bible is to apply it, live it. You learn it to live it. You learn it to live it. That's the whole fi system of faith. On the one side, you learn it. and the other ha half, you live it. If all you're doing is learning, then 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 8 says, then it, it puffs you up. You, you think you're okay and you're not because there has to be that continuity of learning and living. You're learning to live it. You're learning to live it. And that's the name of the game. This is New Covenant thinking, and, of course, that's important. So notice that the word me, if you put a line above the E, that makes that the E long, and that's me, and that's, a, that's the word not. And it identifies a negative, right, the word not, the may negative. So the, it's a... There's a negative aspect. Something's occurring. There's a negative aspect uh, in assembling. Or why don't you go to church on a regular basis business? Not forsaking. Notice, notice that word. It's a compound. Uh, notice it's got two prepositions, in and kata, and then the, the verbal idea, lepo. So that's a pretty powerful idea. Um, not for a second. You ought to be identified with the body of Christ for spiritual growth momentum in your life. But you've left them. For some reason, you've left this out as a priority in your life. And that's the idea of forsaking. In other words, what is your motive? Why are you not doing this? Do you not understand the importance of it? Yeah, well, what's hindering you? Well, this and that and this and that. There's always something. The reason there's always something is that you have your priorities screwed up. And all of that's found in this little word, in kata lepo. <laughs> in means in, and kata means to a norm and standard, and lepo means you've left it. Okay? You once, say, forsaking something means you once had it. I mean, once you were active in the Word of God, that Word of God was the most important thing in your life, Newborn babes desired the sincere milk of the word. You knew how important it was to your growth. You knew how important it was to your life. Now, all of a sudden, you've gotten, quote, busy. And, uh, and uh, a whole new norm and standard has developed in your life, in your life, in kata. And uh, you've left it. 
you've left it. You've, you've left it out of the, the scale of priorities in your life. You've left it out. And, um, and, it's, and, and it's become habitual. Notice this. Notice what he says. Not forsaking our own assembling together. That's the key, together. As is the habit of some. Not all. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a church. If everybody did it, if everybody behaved the way you had behaved, there would be none. If there would be no assembly, there would be the church. There would be a church because the church is made up of people. But they wouldn't be in assembly of like minds, learning the word of God to live it and and to produce. Consider considering how to stimulate one another, for example, in faith and hope and love and divine production. Right. This is the dynamics of the body of Christ. This is the dynamic of priestly service to the church. And so he gives us a negative. That's a problem. And then he gives us two positives. But encouraging. The word but is Allah in contrast. In contrast for, to, for listen, he says, look, let me, let me, here's what he says to those who come to Bible study. Encourage those who don't. That fair? Encourage them. You know, don't browbeat them. Encourage them. Listen to what he says. He said, now for those, he says, so here's part of your priestly function. Number one, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. F listen, find a day. We meet on Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and uh, on Saturday in the School of Biblical Theology and on Sunday. Find a day and, and find a day that you can fit in. And if you can't fight in, fit in, there's something wrong with your schedule or your job or something. And if there's another day that fits you and, and you think that you can find two other people to come with you, I will teach you another day. I don't care. I teach you every day of the week. Yeah, I mean, I'll be glad to do that. So if you don't have one day out of the week, now we just do it three, we do it three days every week, and then we do it twice a month in the School of Biblical Theology. We do a lot of teaching here. But look, where two or three, together, where two or three are gathered, I'll be gathering with them. <laughs> so, I mean, if Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday, and Saturday don't fit your schedule, give me one day you got, and I'll fit it. I mean, that's about as fair as I can be because these wonderful people pay my salary to do this very work. So, and I love it, so there's no problem on my end of it. I'll meet with you in the morning, the afternoon, or night. I don't bother me either. People say to me, well, I work a second shift. Well, so do I. I'll be right with you. Well, I work third shift. That's all right. I do, I'll do. i be right with you. Care? I got it. I, I work seven days, you know, seven days, 24 hours a day. I work my, my schedule is yours. I don't know what could be possibly the problem. So encourage. He uses the word. He says, but in contrast, exercise your priesthood, priesthood this way. Uh, encourage. Pull alongside, encourage, pull alongside somebody that ought to be here, is not here, you've missed them, you contact them, and you encourage them. You don't browbeat them, you don't shame them, you encourage them. What's going on? Let me see how we can fix it. Uh, look, if you can get three people, I'll come to your house. How about that? I care where you live. Well, I'm not going to take a boat anywhere to get to you. You know, I'm not going to get on an ocean liner or take an airplane. But other than that, so for me, that's encouraging. So we should encourage priesthood function is encourage one another. And then the third one, watch this. There's a whole phrase in this deal. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, this word drawing near, is a present active participle. It's the idea is drawing near or approaching. And you know what that day is? What is that day that's approaching? Second coming of Christ, isn't it? 
what is eminent, see, drawing and near approaching is what we call the eminence of the return in it. And it's a present active participle. So we laid out three present active participles uh, here. W one is a negative and two, in other words, in your priest, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Number two, encourage one another, encourage one another not to forsake it. And for those who have, encourage them to come back. Encourage them to come back. What, whatever reason you had to leave, come back. Because the word of God is the most important thing to your life. The word of God. And being taught categorically where you can actually put your hands on it, taste it, smell it, and live it. You know, business. And then, and, and all the more, listen to that. And all the more as you see the day, the day. And all the more as you see the day approaching. You know what that means? It means that some of the people that have left had stayed long enough to get solid in the word of God. They, they, when they left, they were, they were not baby believers. They were immature or mature believers have forsaken it, right? Because they're the ones, when he says, and all the more as you see the day approaching, um, they know that. They know what this means. And those who are actively engaged know what that means. And we ought to be reaching out to people that... Once we're in the word of God, I mean, I meet, listen, I meet him all the time. I once was real active in the church. I was on fire and I just got out of it. Now, I, you know, I know. Come on back. Come on home. We haven't shut the door on you. And uh, probably all the people you knew that was here was you have left too. So there's a whole new group to welcome. You don't know that you was ever, uh, had ever left. <laughs> right? I said, we should call our church Eusta. I used to go there because that's all I hear. Yeah, I used to go to doctrinal studies. I said, that's what we should have called our church. I used to. I used to go. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18 says. I'm going to instruct you to do good. Notice that. Notice the first word in that. That's a double word is agathos ergon. That's one word. They took, uh, they took, they took the two words and put them together and made one word. To do good, to do good, to be rich in good works. Notice he used agathos on the one side and put them into one word, do good, and then he turned around on uh, and said to be rich in good work and he used kalos ergon. He used the two words for good. That are the dynamic words. These are the big words for good. He used them both in the same in the same idea. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, storing up for themselves treasures of a good foundation for the future, so that may take hold of that, so that you may take hold of that which is life indeed. Notice that? Life indeed. Life indeed. You know what life indeed is? A short time on earth and a long time in heaven. Short time on earth. Now, you don't know that when you're 16 or 17. You discover that when you get gray hair. So I'm going to talk about three things tonight about considering how to stimulate yourself in good works. For those who are dropping in with us today, you want to go back. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, this is my fourth lesson on this very subject of how to stimulate. Okay? Uh, consider how to stimulate. And we've talked about love. We've talked about, we've talked about faith, hope, love, and tonight, good works. And this is a, a short series in it that the writer developed, not me. Uh, so here's the first thing. Every new covenant, believer, priest, every, listen, Every believer under the new covenant, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, if you believe that, if you believe that Christ is the source of that regarding your sin, you're saved. If you believe it. Romans 1.16 tells us if you believe it. The gospel is the power of God to save those who believe. Therefore, when that occurs in your life, you have Ephesians 2.8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself it is a gift not of works. So that's very important. Listen, there is no other way. 
Jesus is the only way. And it is narrow. It's not the broad way anybody can get there, just be a good person. It is the narrow way. Because not everybody's good because you're under Adamic sin. No matter how good you are, you're still condemned. You're under 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin because you're a human being. Wherefore, by one man sin into the world and death by sin, and so it spread to all men for all of the sin. That lumps us all together. And Adam all die, and Christ are all made alive. There's no third place. If you think there's a third place, you've been deceived. You've been deceived. And God has drugged you in here to tell you the truth. Now, what you do with that's your business. But I gave you scripture. That's not my opinion. I gave you scripture. And so every new covenant believer is a priest. The moment it's one of the 20 status privileges. The moment you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, the moment you believe that, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Christ. And with that, you, become, you get 20 status privileges. One of them is that you are a believer priest. Every church age believer, new covenant, is a priest. A priest. I'm a priest not because I have a seminary degree. I'm a priest because I believed in Jesus Christ. And you're a priest for the same reason. You're a priest. And what we're talking about in these four lessons lumped together, this little series, many series that we're in, is talking about your priesthood function. This is about your priesthood function. Now, I want you to go to Matthew with me. Matthew 22. I'm going to show you something. Matthew 22. Uh, actually, Matthew 12. Matthew 12. I had Matthew 22 last night. I still got it on my mind. Matthew 12. And I'm looking at verse 34 and 35. He's in a, he's in a little series. You have his study Bible. It's, it's called the leaven. It's going to be verse 33, 34, 35. In verse 35, uh, he's going, he, in verse 35, he'll quote Psalm 78. Uh, he spoke another parable to them. He said, the, I mean, verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman. Hmm. I thought that was wrong. Chapter 12. Chapter 12, in a series called the, the Words Reveal Character, at least that's how it's broke down in mind, and, 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 he's, and he's, he's pounding with the, the pharisaical ideas in verse 34, uh, well, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and the fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. Now, you got a great example here of the concept of chaos. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? Now, in uh, the, good, the good that's used in here, agathos, in the first part of this, it's agathos. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? That's agathos. For the mouth speaks out of what fills the heart. These are incompatible. They're incompatible. Evil is, the, listen, and here's why it is. Evil repre is represented by Satan. And Agatha's good is represented by God. Okay? And so what you're talking about is the character or the essence of what promotes these. Agatha's good is promoted promoted by the character of God, his essence, the dynamics of his person. And evil is done by the, the nature or the essence of Satan. Right. Now, what he says is how it affects the human life. Watch this. And he does it with a tree. You understand? The fruit of the tree is based on the, 
on the constitution or the nature of the tree. If the tree is healthy, it produces healthy fruit. If it's bad, it produces bad fruit, okay? A bad tree can't produce good fruit, right? That's what the writer is, is making a point. And then verse 34, you, you brood of vipers, how can you be an evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of, the, out of that which fills the heart. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good, and evil men out of their evil treasures bring forth what is evil. Okay? And so what the writer's trying to tell us there is about the, how, the, how, this, how Agathos and Kalos are go, both going to work. They're going to work out of their sourcing out of their character, out of their constitution, out of their nature. Uh, and listen, what he's, what, what he's going to talk about, an evil heart can't produce good things. And wh who makes the standard? Like if you talk about evil and good today, without the word of God that tells you what is evil and what is good, everybody's got their own opinion. Well, the, today people are calling what the Bible calls good, they call evil, and what the Bible calls evil, they call good. You can't leave it to the human standard. The Bible has to tell you, the word of God has to tell you because he's the one that came up with these words. Man didn't come up with these words. God came up with these words and has to, has to be defined in that way. And here's the point. Evil can't produce good. Uh, Poneros or Kekos, Kekos evil cannot produce good. It can't produce Agathos and it can't produce Kalos can't produce it and he uses a tree he uses a tree as an example of that in in romans the seventh chapter verse 18 he says he says nothing good well let me just get it to you romans 7 18 i know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh for the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Can't do it. C cannot do it. Cannot do it. And, it, and, and the, his point is, is that there is no way that man can produce it by the standard that God has set by Agathos good. Man has a standard of good, and it's always within his reach. But man, without being born again, without the divine will of God working and supplying what he needs in him, can't do it. That's what the writer, that's what Paul is saying in Romans the seventh chapter, verse 18. Now, this is why you have to be saved. That's why, listen, what man says is good works doesn't work. Now, Let's go over to Ephesians a moment and see why salvation is important. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 10, because, you know, I always quote verse 8 and 9, for by grace I say through faith business. And here's verse 10. I don't leave it out because it's not important. I just think the other is important when you talk about salvation. He said, for we are his workmanship, those of us who believe the gospel of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you're saved through faith. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I mean, we've, we've been created for good works. Listen, we've been born again to be able to do Agathos works, to do the, the works. And, and you know why we can? Because we have the nature of constitution, first by birth and second, by the Holy Spirit, and third, by the Word of God. And it takes that combination to be effective. If you're going to be, if you're going to be a, a great tree, if you're going to be a great tree that produces a lot of fruit, that combination has to be there. you got to be born again. you got to be spiritual under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. you got to be growing. you got to be growing and healthy in the Word of God. Jesus said that... When you are a healthy one like that, you will produce a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. You remember that? I mean, that's the key. And so this is what 
Ephesians uh, 2.10, for we are, his, we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We should walk. Right. Absolutely. Oh, oh, the workman is one that's been created to walk in Agathos good. And there's no reason I do it. And that's why, and listen, it requires all that. It requires for the body of Christ under the New Testament, it requires a whole, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It requires of spiritual growth, all the grace operating assets that are available to you, you need to be accessible to them. And not only that, but the body of Christ is so designed with spiritual gifts uh, to, meet, to meet your emotional, uh, spiritual needs, physical needs, emotional needs, you know, body, soul, and spirit. That's what the church is about. And God has designed spiritually gifted uh, avenues to meet those needs that are physical, those that are emotional, those who are, that, that are spiritual. The church. We go everywhere but the church. Now, a healthy church, it has, takes a healthy church to be able to do that. A church that understands what salvation is, what spirituality is, and how to develop spiritual growth momentum in their life so they can be that healthy tree that can produce a lot of fruit that other people need. And it takes that. Now, let's go to one more, and that's Philippians. Let's go to Philippians a moment. Philippians, the first chapter. And listen, God saved us for this, did he not? We are his workmanship created. We're workmen. Now, in Philippians 1.6, he says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not, no, I don't want that. That's not 1.6. I don't, that was 2, wasn't it? I was in 2. I'm all over the place tonight. For I am confident of this very thing, watch this, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, we just talked about it, and you will perfect it until. If it's not being perfected in your life, it's because you've forsaken it. You've left the mojo. Listen, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, right? That's, Eph that's Ephesians 2.10. Will perfect it until the day, there we are again, of Christ Jesus. All right? We talk about second coming. Listen, this priesthood, listen to me, this is important. This priesthood that we're talking about is the dynamics within the body of Christ until the second coming of Christ. It needs to be functional. Right? And listen, that's why not forsaking is a key. In Titus, in Titus 2, 14, who, verse 13 says, Savior Jesus Christ, this, our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous of good deeds. Kalos Ergon. Kalos Ergon. Th that is the emphasis is not on the tree, it's on the fruit. Agathos is more on the tree, a good, healthy tree. God has designed it, created it to produce healthy fruit. Now, the tree's got to stay healthy to produce. It's going to produce, but it can produce bad fruit or no fruit. It's designed to produce good fruit. And what it's going to produce is, is something. K K Kalos is the kind of production. It's the fruit that you can pick it off. You can smell it. You can taste it, Right? You can cut it up and bake a pie or, or do uh, applesauce. Maybe cut them up in little pieces and put some peanut butter on it. I'm just talking about how I live. Mm -hmm. 
Agathos is the tree created in such a way to be highly productive. It's only going to be highly productive because God has created it, and that tree knows that it's operating by that source. That tree is going to produce, the fruit it's going to produce is what, is what the tree's been designed in the creative plan of God to do, or the recreation, right? And the kalos is the fruit. It's the visible, tangible, productive fruit. It's visible. You can taste it. You can smell it. You can eat it. When it gets bad spots on it, you can cut up and throw it in the backyard and the squirrels and the whatever, uh, what else is out there and only God knows, I suppose. Probably if you had a camera out there at night, you'd be scared to go ever back, ever go out in your backyard again. Right, Don? You have all kinds of creatures coming in your backyard, don't you? It's like a zoo out there, isn't it? Don lives out, Don lives out in a habitat zoo. No telling what show up in his backyard. Well, anyhow, this is a trustworthy statement, Titus 3, 8. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. That's kalos, Aragon. These are good, Kalos, and profitable for men. Listen, listen, we're the ones that take the fruit to the market. We take the fruit to the market. We don't create anything. We pick the fruit and take it to the market. The writer, point number two, the writer of Hebrews says that new covenant believer priests should consider how to stimulate one another to good works until the second coming of Christ. Listen, there's no short end of this. I hear, I don't hear it around here, but I used to hear this idea. Um, well, you know, I've, I, I, and I thank God we don't have it with Johnny. Well, you know, I've I've pulled my time in the church. I taught Sunday school, and I taught this, and I taught that, and I taught this, and now it's time for the younger ones to take over. Well, how many younger ones are you teaching to take over then? That's my answer. What are you, what are you doing now? If you're not teaching the younger ones to take over, you're, you're not off the hook. And let me tell you, if you ever start that, you'll never quit because there's always young ones coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I used to hear that all the time. Well, let somebody else do it. You know, I served 40 years. Well, I, look, you think you're dead, but you're not because I'm talking to you. So you're not dead. So, you know, what are you talking about? You talk about forsaking. Can't do that. I'm not saying you ought to be running with the little kids, but I'm saying... There's something for you to do in the church. What do you mean you're quitting? Retiring. Hey, you know, I've served 40. This, this is not the army. This is until Jesus Christ comes, right? You don't have any short timers. What's this short timer stuff? That's a military term, I guess. That's what they called me anyhow when I got out. All three participles used in our text... All three participles were used to describe the responsibility and the length of the ministry of the new, new covenant believer priest in church history. This is the story of church history. Three participles says, don't do this, do this, and do this until Christ comes. <laughs> you know, people go like, well, how long are you going to preach, Ron? Well, I don't know, but I'm, if I can, I'm going to preach till Christ comes. I mean, well, where do I get that? All over the scriptures. Now, maybe nobody will come and listen, but I tell you what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to do it till Jesus comes. I don't have any out. Don't have any out. It says I'm to do this until Christ comes. I'm going to do that. Now, that's my priesthood function. My gift is teaching. I'm going to teach. I 
What do you mean I'm not going to, not going to forsake the assembling of myself, myself together with other people because it gives me a great opportunity. And it's my ministry, it's a priesthood. And I'm, I'm under command. I'm under command until the second coming of Christ. I guess you know I've been talking to some people like that lately, right? <laughs> I'm like, I got my little stand and I'm standing, I'm <laughs> reaching on it. All right. <coughs> Don't... <coughs> Don't forsake, but encourage those who have, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Second coming of Christ. And here's, here's what's wonderful about this. Acts 111. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who, who has been taken up from you into heaven, who is just, who has just been taken up, will come. Watch this. Now that watch this, believers will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. How about that? And we still look for that, don't we? And we tell everybody else to look for that. Think how many generations Johnny hasn't seen that, looked up to the sky. It's a bird, it's a plane. It's Jesus, not Superman. Okay, that's not a big deal then. I was looking for Jesus. That's who I look in the sky for. I don't look for any of the other things. Listen to this, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Who are the them? Those are the believers of the new covenant believers who have died and gone on to be with Jesus. Then we who are alive and remain, this is why we we are alive and remain. If you're alive and remain, you're to remain functional until he comes, right? Unless some, you know, there are a lot of reasons why you may not be functional, but that's up to the Lord, isn't it? Not up to you. You know, when that's up to the Lord. That's just up to the Lord. Who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. See, the Lord is always with you now. And I'm not sure you're always with him. But one day is coming when he returns and you're alive and remain, you're going to be with him for all, forever. Now, he's with you forever, right? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it would be well for you to, to, to pray that back to him, wouldn't it? Lord, I tell you, I, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Wouldn't that be a good prayer? I, I pray that every day. Because I know I'm, I'm a made of flesh and have volition. So, you know, I begin my day in the Garden of Gethsemane because of it. Point number three. Now, this is real important, so I want you to listen to it. Now, I, I gave you a heads up on agathos and, and kalos. There are two Greek words that dominate the doctrinal study of good works or divine production. They are agathos and kalos. Agathos refers to an absolute good. In other words, it is something that God has willed, designed, created, and it flows from his character, his nature, his essence in a multitudes of way, okay? It is attached to God out of divine design, and it, it's designed to produce divine, divine good. It's an agathos that's designed to produce out of us a design to produce fruit. Fruit. And listen, the fruit, and, and, and w w as the... As the high, as the priest, as the priest, we have the fruit, and the fruit is beneficial to other people. That whatever the work of God that He's called us to do, uh, within that sphere of responsibility within the body of Christ, whatever that is, and listen, there is no way that you don't have something. Every person that's been born again has a spiritually gifted ministry to the body of Christ. Now, to that spiritual maturity 
uh, equips you to do all sorts of work, doesn't he? In the body of Christ. So this is really important. This is important because chaos is about the benefit of the chaos fruit that we get. We have we have the tree, the tree, the the uh, uh, the agathos tree tree that produces fruit. The fruit it produces is what we're interested in. Now we're part of the tree, so to speak, Agathos, when we got saved, it was Agathos that brought us into that whole system. It was the it was the goodness of God, not the goodness of man. But the idea behind Kalos is the idea that is beneficial to the one who picks it and the one who the one who receives it. The whoever receives Kalos it's beneficial. And Kalos, the reason it's connected this way, Kalos is, is tangible. It's visible. It's, that's why it's, it's used with a, a true tree with fruit or a ground that can produce, you know, the, remember the parable of the good ground that produces fruit? That's the concept of it. I, I, let me give you. Let me. Let me give you. If you. If you remember the story. You remember the story of Barnabas, who uh, was wealthy when he got converted. He had a lot of real estate holdings. The church got under enormous uh, persecution, in Acts chapter four, and he gave a large tract of land. You remember that? Sold a large tract of land, and gave it uh, to the to the to the church who were desperate. I mean, they were desperate. I mean, this was used for food and clothing, that type of thing. You remember this story? Well, it's in Acts 4. What is interesting is how he is described in Acts 11. In Acts, in Acts 11, verse 24, he's referred to, well, let me just, tell, let me just read it. I didn't write the whole thing out, so let me just, Acts 11, Acts 11. What happens often is I put a whole lesson together, then I go back and look at it, and then I start messing with it. <laughs> That's how I get in this mess. 11, uh, 1124 is what I have on paper. This is talking about Barnabas. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a considerable number were brought to the Lord, and he left and went to Tarsus, and he found Paul. Okay? He, 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 is, he is referred to as a good man, and he's referred to as an agathos good man, a good man. In other words, uh, he is a chip off the old block, <laughs> He's a, 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 a healthy branch. Uh, he's been transplanted off from the good tree. This is going to, this is a good man. You see what I mean? That's the point. You remember in the, the rich young ruler when he says, remember we studied this recently, good teacher, and he uses the word agathos, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, oh, are you calling me good? See, that would have been quite a breakthrough, and we mentioned it when we were there. No one is good except God alone. He used the word agathos. Use the word agathos. Uh, I mentioned Romans 8, 28 earlier to you where, where it's mentioned. Kalos refers to what is called intrinsic good. Intrinsic good operating from an inward nature or constitute uh, is the primary me meaning behind it. Uh, it's called, in, in Matthew 12, 22, it's called a fruit. And, and uh, in Matthew 13, 23, it's connected with the ground. And it's because, as I mentioned, if you have a tree, then it's, it's what it produces. 
and what it produces is is important to us what it produces it's what what fruit it produces is the Kalos fruit it's the fruit of it uh, Jesus in um, well that that's how he, I just was making point uh, first Timothy four and five use uses this idea for everything created by God is good Kalos now, that's because it's handed off to you. Because God is good, and of course everything he produces would be good. The point that the writer is making by using chaos here is how beneficial that it is that there's fruit. Now watch this. Everything created by God is good, nothing be, to be rejected. If it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by the means of the word of God and prayer. Does anybody have an idea what this prayer is about? It's about eating. It's about being thankful for the food you have. Right? But listen, this word in the Septuagint, which is Greek translation of the Hebrew, every time you see the word good in the days of creation, you, you, you can find it in every day but one. I wrote them down in your paper. You're going to find this word good in every day but one. There's one day of creation. If you want to know, you're going to have to study it. I don't feed you everything. But every day but one, the word is good. You know, at the end, he says it's good. Remember that? It's chaos. Everything that Agathos God created, now pay attention. Is chaos, it was created for you to benefit from it. That's why the chaos is used. That's why the writers use chaos. It's beneficial for you. Day one, day three, day four, day five. I wrote all the places down for you to check it out. Therefore, chaos is the word that's most associated with the believer priest, like in our passage of Hebrews 10, it, it, is, it dominates, for example, Romans 12, 2, 16, 19, Colossians 1, 9, and 10. Now, here's one that's kind of interesting. Go to Galatians with me. It's just it's kind of interesting. I, what I'm trying to tell you is every time you see the word good, you don't know what it really means in the English. You don't always know what it means. In the sixth chapter, verse 9, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. Now, he tells you two things there. He tells you not to lose heart and not to grow weary in what? He tells you two, two things, you, you, right? Doing good, right? Listen, there's two things. This, when you get into doing good, chaos, that's chaos. When you get into doing good, there's two things they're gonna, that you got to watch out for. Right? What are they? Look, look at verse 9. What are they? Not to, be, not to become discouraged, not to lose heart, right? And not grow weary. Keep your, eye on the, keep your eye on the goal. Keep your eye on the purpose. Keep your eye on, on the mission, ain't it? And let me tell you, anytime you ever get into your life, listen, th 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 this is a, a real life human thing. You just didn't know the terms for it. If you're an athlete, if you're a businessman, if you're a military guy, I don't care what you are. This, this is a deal here. You got to keep your eye on the. You got to keep your eye on the prize, so to speak. I mean, the, any any good thing like this in doing good has the possibility, the probability would be a better word of losing heart and growing weary. And he warns us of it, doesn't he? Gives us heads up. You play. You know what? I sports. Our coach made us run all summer so that we could play fourth quarter football. 
because the first five games of the season, you could win the fourth quarter if your guys were in shape because everybody didn't, everybody wasn't. You could win ball games in fourth quarter, but by the second half of the season, everybody was in line. Now, you, now you got now, now you better have grown a little, because people got weary, and they lost heart. When people get weary, they lose heart, lose heart, and become weary. Well, anyhow, that's important. But look at verse ten. So then, while we have opportunity, while we have opportunity, well, that's a great word, Anna Horton. Well, we have a great well, listen. God will give you more opportunity than you can handle. Right? Or you got to say, I'm open for opportunity. <laughs> He'll load your plate. Well, we have opportunity. Let us do good. It changed the word on us. Agathos. Use the word agathos. Use the word agathos. Use kalos in verse 9. Use agathos in verse 10. You know what? And that is buying into God's program working in our life called doing his will. That's exactly what it is. Let us do good to all men and especially to those of the household of God. Now, looking at the bigger picture. Here's the bigger picture. The bigger picture is always the Agathos picture. And we're down here doing chaos. And chaos is, can get weary and tiresome and burdensome. And, right? I mean, Jesus found it. I mean, Jesus didn't have any easy time with this. Right? And the more agathos was demanded of him, the tougher it got. God never puts on you more than you can what? Bear. Bear. Got that right. Now, in closing, during the Feast of Dedication in John 10, Jesus declared that he and God were one. That's in John 10, 30. <laughs> Listen, he said, he said, God and I are Agathos. They picked up stones to kill him. They picked up stones to kill him. If he'd have lived in the south, they'd all went to the truck and got their shotgun. <laughs> Jesus responded, I showed you many good works. Kalos. Aragon. See what he did? You touch, feel, handle, experience, smell, you know, the five senses. From the Father, I showed you many good chaos ergons from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? I healed people blind, uh, this, I did this, I did that, I did that, you know, the visible stuff, the fruit, I brought you fruit, right? Touch, taste, handle, smell, whatever else goes with that. The Jews answered him, For a good work, Kalos work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. This is why you need to die. Wow. Wow. So what is my point? First Thessalonians 5.21, Hold fast to that which is Kalos. I don't know if it's on your paper or not. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, hold fast, stand firm to that which is good, chaos, because that's what benefits people. That's what benefits. Your Christian life experiences brought out to other people that they can taste, tan, handle, and whatever, okay? So... Let's close in prayer. Let's see. Glenda, how are we with your foot before we start prayer? Are you been back to the doctor? Have you had surgery or what? Uh -huh. Last Friday morning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And Horton, you're you're mending a little better. Still have breathing problems, probably with that crack ribbed. A little bit. And you're leaving Friday. I leave Saturday morning. 
Saturday morning for Kentucky with 8,000 kids. All right. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way tonight and studied with us. For those on the Internet that dropped in, we pray they would find one of the weeks and just stay with us. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, or Sunday morning, or all of them, whatever, but find one and stay. Uh, stay in a, in a system of study and grow. We pray for Glenda tonight, Father, for healing, for Gary, and, and for so many others in our church. Uh, we thank you, Father, for all the healing that you have provided with so many people in the church, and we have, we have touched the throne with it, and we thank you for responding in such a glorious way with it. And uh, we pray for Gary as he prepares Saturday to take a trip to Kentucky and uh, prepare the hearts of the people, Father, and the conditions uh, uh, to be able to keep him mobile and for healing for strength, supernatural stuff, Father, that we know you can do by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We're thankful for it, for the healing that's already occurred. Continue, Father, with Glenda, heal her foot. You know, may her body be exemplified by her soul like John talks about in his smaller epistles, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.